Well, I'm uh, extremely pleased and uh, honored to be here. And um, I, I just think this is a very exciting uh, idea. And I really want to give a tremendous amount of credit to George Brown for putting this together. This was uh, something that George and I had talked about. And I talked to uh, Jan and, and a variety of you online about it as well. And I, I thought that. And I had some, my wife is involved in uh, taking care of patients with cystic fibrosis. And the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation was a group that, uh, uh, granted, cystic, there's a lot more cystic fibrosis than cystinuria, but cystic fibrosis really drove the agenda. They were able to raise a lot of money and get doctors to become interested in cystic fibrosis when it was really languishing as a disease. And cystinuria has a disadvantage of being much less common than cystic fibrosis. And unlike cystic fibrosis, that we just need one just one fabulously wealthy person with cystinuria to help help fund this. Um, you know, yeah. we just, who, is, who is that fabulously wealthy person? Um, and another example is uh, the OHF, the Oxalosis and Hyperoxaluria Foundation, which really does have one wealthy person who put that together. And they put together an agenda, and they've gotten uh, the NIH to put together a, found, uh, a symposium uh, every couple of years. And, and that's a group of people. Um, that's a disease that's as infrequent uh, as cystinuria and other cause of kidney stones. Um, so I, I thought that uh, all of you uh, should come together, and uh, particularly you know, as patients, come together and agree on a way of, uh, of making this happen, of keeping this in the forefront, of keeping uh, doctors and patients interested uh, and telling the government that this is something that uh, needs to be studied more avidly. So with that in mind, I'm going to do a, a very uh, a review that will be maybe too simple for some of you and perhaps uh, eye-opening for others. It's going to be a review of uh, some aspects of kidney function that I think that uh, we speak about a lot and uh, how we, uh, and how, where cystinuria comes from, how it occurs. Uh, and then um, Dr. Goodyear and Dr. Aspen will talk about some uh, other specifics of uh, management and uh, testing in, in uh, patients with cystinuria. Uh, I'd be glad to take questions uh, when this is over, too. Here's the urinary tract. And this is the, uh, the urinary tract. Here it is. Gray's Anatomy, 1918. Now it turns out that we have made no progress since then in describing the urinary tract. It hasn't changed, basically, <laughs> since 1918. Two kidneys drained by the ureters. The ureters drain into the bladder. And a KUB is a simple x-ray that usually actually doesn't show anything unless there's a kidney stone on there. But the kidneys, it's called a KUB because kidneys, ureter, and bladder presumably appear on that film, uh, though only in the presence of a stone would there be something to see with respect to the kidneys, the ureter, or the bladder. Most of the time, none of those organs would actually be present on a film like that. And the kidney com is composed of different parts. If you ask a nephrologist what are the parts of the kidney, they'd say the nephrons and the blood vessels. If you asked a surgeon like Michael Grasso, he'd say the upper pole and the lower pole. Um, the different, the other way of looking at this, though, is that the kidney has a cortex, and that's where most of the functioning nephrons uh, exist. And the medulla, shown here as those se separate sections, are where all of the tubules come together and f have basically the end product of the nephron is the urine. And the urine comes together into the calyces. And most of you know this anatomy from having your own films done. The calyces are basically the drains. Each of these pyramids is full of tubules bringing urine together. The calyces come together and basically are filled with urine. And the calyces all unite to form what's called the pelvis of the kidney. And the pelvis is drained by the urine. If we concentrate on uh, these, the pyramids, we'll get there in a second, but I first want to show you that the kidney is perfused. It gets its blood supply from the renal artery. The blood goes into the glomeruli, the little tiny uh, corpuscles of capillaries. And after the urine is formed, it drains down the ureter here. There are different uh, branches that we don't have to talk about. And I'm going to concentrate then on the pyramids 
which look like this, just to emphasize the fact that the functioning units, the part that's actually filtering the blood, are those little round circles. Those are little uh, corpuscles of capillaries. The plasma, the liquid part of the blood, moves across the capillary into the nephron, the tubule, uh, and the tubules then all come together and are drained down here. So little red dots are in the cortex. The pyramids here consist of some of the blood vessels and the collecting tubules <coughs> where the urine flows. So here's a summary of what those nephrons look like. You stay up there. And I'll just, I'll, you'll do that? I'll do that. Boy. You're a good guy. So the nephron consists of a glomerulus, the little capillaries of blood, and across the glomerulus comes the plasma, the liquid part of the blood, and it's drained by the proximal tubule. Now, the rest of the nephron is basically composed of sections that are going to determine what that fluid turns into. It starts out as plasma, the liquid part of the blood. What comes out at the bottom here in the collecting duct is called urine. And it's the nephron that's going to determine what's in the urine. For the most part, a lot of the nephron is devoted to reabsorbing the stuff in the plasma that you don't want to lose. All of the plasma is going to get filtered several times a day, and most of what's in that plasma you don't want to have go out in your urine. So most of the nephron is going to reclaim, reabsorb most of the salt and most of the potassium and most of the other amino acids that are in the urine. To some extent, the nephron is also going to secrete things from the blood into the urine. There's some things that you're going to get rid of because your kidney is going to actively move them from the blood side into the tubule. But most of what we're going to talk about today has to do with reclaiming what's been filtered. And what's been, what's been filtered, two thirds of which will be reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. The proximal tubule will reclaim the bulk of what's been filtered. And that's where cysteine is, is supposed to be reabsorbed. All of the stuff is filtered and then it gets reabsorbed. The work of the kidney is in the reabsorption process. The work of the, fil the filtration part, in a way, is not really the kidney's work. It's actually the heart that does the work of filtration in the sense that the heart provides the pressure that filters the plasma. The kidney's oxygen requirement comes from reclaiming all of the stuff that's been filtered. It moves from the, neck, from the tubule back into the blood. So that's the kidney's use of oxygen, of energy, ATP. 